sisters. You don't have a husband or wife. She's a stay at home wife, and he's an engineer. You get the idea. So that they had a specific client that would do it the house. These were open, something like 10,000 people would come in, you know, the first weekend. The Eames's house, they did, oh, and they were supposed to be built. This is another thing. They were supposed to be built affordably. That is really the point. To show people that it didn't have to be a mansion to be good on their own. So the Eameses decided to make theirs affordable by using only ready-made industrial materials. Ready-made meaning there were eight by eight modules factory produced for industrial construction. So that's why this house is kind of put together out of sections all of which using standard, the I-beams came in standard sizes. Nothing was done to custom. And while this may represent the exterior that we saw with Griefeld with Drasteel and Mondrian colors, that's not what they were looking at. They put color in because they liked the bright colors. And they used that kind of modular treatment in their storage units that they later designed. This, this house is still standing. And this house is open to the public. And this is the interior as it was Spartan. And this is the interior the way Ray and Charles were living in it. Uh, Ray was a great collector of stuff, as many designers do. She picked up things. She picked up, you know, tchotchkes. She picked up little objects. She picked up souvenirs. She picked up dolls. She picked up swatches of fabric. She kept things in a drawer in her uh, lots of drawers. I saw a reconstruction of her office in a museum exhibition. You would pull out the office spools of thread and different shaped spools, which she would use for inspiration. And then the prettiest of them, she would arrange in the interior of the uh, house. And lots of textiles. She was primarily a textile designer. And this is a much more much fairer interior, the house for John Intenza, which was the publisher. He was the publisher of Arts and Architecture. And he had Charles Eames and Eero Saradin together join, uh, to design his house, which has some of the elements of California architecture, which were the interior to the exterior. You wouldn't put this quite as open if you were building it in Westchester or Connecticut, or certainly in Maine. You know, and you wouldn't do it, well, you might do some of it in Florida, you'd have to shelter it more from the sun. So this worked for California living. All but the case, all of the case study houses, but one, once in Arizona, the rest were in California, most of them concentrated around Los Angeles. This is probably, this and the Eames House are the two most famous. This is also open to the public. And this one, interestingly, is owned by the sons of the family for whom it was built. And they, they make a living from this house. I took a, a, I had some students, we took a trip to California as part of the study, not abroad, last year, and um, two years ago. And we got a trip, I got us into the house. We got a tour of the house with the family, with the son and daughter-in-law, who the son grew up there. And what's interesting about this, just, you see where this is built. This is built sort of on the side of the cliff. This is a photograph, this is from an ad. This has been used in a number of, in photo shoots, it's been in a couple of films. Um, so they make money renting it out. They don't live there. Here, this sort of falls off a cliff. I mean, that corner, that's this far corner, projects out. This is on the land. But over here, it goes downhill very sharply. And um, I think his name was Mark. He said they were there, there were three young children. And he was a year and a half old. And I said, how did your parents live here with three little, oh, they were all under five. And he said, well, we got up in the morning and they put on life vests. And we ran around in our orange life vests. I said, well, that's how you didn't fall in the pool, but how did you not fall over the side of the cliff? And he said, we play there, and I guess you just learn. It's like children learn to avoid hazards. Well, no, it's not that steep. I mean, if you, you could walk down here a little, but it's steep. I mean, if, you know, you could slip down the hill. Um, and it's, you know, they were 
I don't know how affluent they were, but this wasn't a rich, rich, rich person's house. But you know, they probably had help. But it's a, I mean, it's a fabulous space even now. Now, the rooms are not as large as they would be now. Um, the kitchen is open. This is the kitchen. So it's open to the dining room and living room area. The bathrooms are rather small. But this is clearly, uh, this kind of house is still something that would be, well, I don't know. How many of you would like to live in a place like this? Yeah. OK, now why not? I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't. I don't know, not live there, but. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I would. Um, and, and it's partly, I guess it's partly the, it's partly the view, which is really, I mean, you're looking over all of LA, even with the smog. Um, <laughs> this is another one of the houses. Here can I make it. And this one, this is rather stark. This is an advertising shot taken there. Probably, I assume, I only know it's an ad shot, probably for the hi-fi unit which was a big deal at that point. Um, and this is a shot of Ezra Stoller. I put this on to remind me to tell you that one of the reasons this house is so famous is this photograph, which is you know, like falling water, which made the house and the idea very famous. Um, this uh, Ezra Stoller, who's a book of his work was published last year, um, he I think he just died last year at something like 102. Still working. Uh, he specialized in architectural photography. And it's to point out, and this will matter to you when you have interiors that you want photographed. The photograph can make the interior look even better than the real thing. But at the very least, it'll make it, it'll show it off at its best. Uh, Richard Neutra, whose work I showed you before, did a case study house too. This one is still standing. And I'm not sure if this house still exists, but I wanted to show you the treatment. This kind of interior is not an off-putting one. So the, the modern design could be very livable. And you see Kaufman. Neutra did a house for the same Kaufmans who had falling water. So in Pennsylvania, they had falling water, and they came out to Palm Springs, which is a very elegant resort area, and had Richard Neutra, an important California architect, design this house for them. Uh, just to show you, modernism didn't always work. They were doing modern urban developments. This was public housing, and what happened, not anything to do, not anything of the fault of Yamasaki who designed this, Designed one of the uh, one of the uh, expansions of the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, this became a drug haven and very very run down. And rather than renovate it, rather than rebuild it, they, the city uh, exploded it. So urban development was something that we had to learn. Maybe we still have to learn a lot of the urban development of the city turned into slums in various cities around the country. And a lot of them were built, or the first of them were built in the 50s. Um, designers in mid-century modernism, uh, I'm just going to show you some of the key furniture designers. And what I'm doing here is showing you just an interior to remind us of the fact that the open kitchen of the past through the family, the beginning of what is now the great room, sort of started then. Because after the war, uh, the people who would have worked as servants, going back, the women who would have worked as servants, the men were all off at the war. Women, so some of the housewives took jobs in the, um, you know, in various jobs that would have been taken by men otherwise. The women who would have been servants took work in the factory. They made more money than they would have as servants. They were helping the war effort. After the war, they didn't want to go back to service. So what happened is people who normally would have had having help, having a, not somebody to come and clean every two weeks or every week, but having a regular household help was something that, let's say in the 30s, middle class people had. That was a usual thing. Not a butler and 10 servants, but, but a maid or a housekeeper. After World War II, 
these people weren't available. The class of people who would have been servants didn't want to be servants anymore. It, would, it was not so much a lower level job, it was also less funny. So here I am, a housewife who used to have somebody to do the cooking and the cleanup for me, I have to do it myself. So I'm enthused at the new idea manufacturers are making. This is when dishwashers came out. This is when washing machines, washers and dryers came out. I never used to have to do my own laundry, right? Now I have to do my own laundry. Most women were not, well, most, let's say middle class, a woman, career women were the exception, not the rule. The guy went out to work, the woman stayed home. And so she had her kitchen, was her headquarters, was her haven. She had all these labor-saving appliances, and she served through the pass-through to the family. She greeted her husband all dressed up. There are all sorts of, it's very interesting, mid-century life. You see refrigerator ads with a little lady all dressed up in high heels. Yeah. You see them. Um, Hi, honey, I'm home was the idea. Your husband is coming home from work. You're supposed to dress up. You put on makeup. You put on your high heels and dress nicely. And you greet him at the door with a martini. And that maybe not at the door with a martini. You serve him a martini and you serve them. But th this was the way things were supposed to happen. And it's a culture that, you know, people don't even sit down to eat together nowadays. Yeah. I mean, I'm told most families, if they sit down together, everybody's at the computer. Or everybody's, well, no, I think 10 years ago, maybe they were all watching television. Now they're all on their iPhones or whatever. Is that a hand? No. No, it's okay. But I mean, so life changed, and the design of the home changed to accommodate life. It's not that the design changed first. Um, Charles and Ray Eames were the most, if you're going to name one, you know, one or two, that, well, they were a team out of the mid-century American designers, the Eames were the first people you would name. They came out of Cranbrook. They started working together. She, let me see, he was married to somebody else and they had fairly divorced his wife. And no great scandal, but a little bit. Anyway, they were lifelong partners and worked together in any number of areas. I mean, graphics, she did textile, they designed furniture together, they designed exhibition, international exhibitions um, for IBM and the country. Um, this is where they started, okay? And this is a sculpture she did playing around with molding. Um, they were hired by the US Navy during the war to design a leg splint. Now, a splint is what, you know, when you have a broken leg or anything.